Hello, tokenizers, and welcome back to the Security Token Show, a short hiatus. But now Kyle and I are back at it again, ready to bring you the latest and greatest news every single week, this time in an even new and improved fashion. Kyle, how are you? Good to see you as always, my friend. Oh, this is great. We had such a successful event just a couple of weeks ago that tokenized this conference with dozens or potentially hundreds of different speakers across all of our different panels. We had amazing institutions on board. We saw how successful the virtual event style of platform is. And I think we have a fun way to transform the security token show and bring it to even higher levels of quality. Absolutely. In the future, you're going to see all kinds of new segments. You're going to hopefully see some new interviewees and a lot more content from the industry beyond just our hot takes, which, of course, today is going to be the primary of the show since we've got a, you know, I think it's three or four weeks now, Kyle, that we got to catch up. So we've definitely got some huge headlines you absolutely need to know about. And of course, as always, we love your feedback. We love your support. Thank you for everybody who's seen this show transform many times over uh, as we continue to bring it to new heights, as you just said, Kyle. So with that, are you ready, Kyle? Shall we head into the token debrief? Let's dive right into the token debrief. Fantastic. Now, for anyone who has been watching the show or listening, you may recall our top five segment. Every week we would cover what's the latest top news you need to know. That's exactly what the Token Debrief is all about. But this time we wanted to bring in more brilliant minds from our team to be able to give their insights as well. So I'm glad to be introducing Jason and Sam from the team here joining us today. What's up, guys? How's it going? Thanks for having us on. Good morning. Good morning to you both. I'm ready to hear everything you have to say, starting out with HSBC, which has announced the fact that they are tokenizing gold. Uh, They actually plan to have tokens represent 0.001 troy ounce. It is not necessarily meant to be retail focused. HSBC is a half trillion dollar plus bank in assets under management. Uh, And this seems to be a new tool that they're testing out, a new method to support their gold initiatives. Uh, Gold is, of course, rising in terms of uh, interest. uh, And tokenization seems to be a pretty good use case, the idea that you could potentially redeem the gold. We've seen many other similar use cases around gold tokenization come to market. I'd love to hear what everyone thinks. Does HSBC have something that others don't? You know, Herwig, I think at first you read the headline and you think, amazing, we're starting to really see this tokenization adoption. People are going to really get involved in gold through tokenization. But if you kind of look beyond the veneers, I really don't know if this headline's as big of a, a big of a deal as you may think. Um, an issue we've seen in the market since really inception is that very low liquidity, very wide spreads. We see almost no volume trading. And so if you're an institution or even an investor, why would you go and buy tokenized gold instead of buying it online with a, with a small margin via the spot price or go and buy the GLD ETF? I don't necessarily know if this is going to really change much just because we're not in a position right now where investors can really take advantage of something like this. Uh, that's, that's definitely a, a good take. Does anyone agree with Sam? Yeah, you know, I think that there's a really interesting piece here where when we talk about blockchain technology and its implementation, it's only actually effective when the entire life cycle of the process is on chain. If you have any intermediaries that are not leveraging the solution, it defeats a lot of the purpose. So from my perspective on this type of thing, this is really blending the financial asset, which as you mentioned, Sam, I don't think that there's healthy liquidity here really to be able to trade, but there is a pretty significant problem in identifying and validating where the actual gold is stored and enforcing the redemptions themselves. And that's one of those pieces where if you can tie that to the actual asset and to the transacting token, you can actually have a much more efficient process in streamlining gold management. So presumably this actually has much more to do with the types of institutions that actually hold the gold and create those investment style of products that as with a lot of tokenization may just end up being behind the scenes. 
No, I think that's a, a good point from both of you. Uh, and we do recall that is not necessarily retail focused. I'll read a quote here from John O'Neill, who's the global head of digital asset strategies, markets, and security services at HSBC. And he says, in addition to demand to native digital assets, we are seeing appetite for tokenization solutions that can maintain a link to specific real world use cases such as gold. Uh, that that definitely gives me the the idea that it's definitely more experimental than than anything. They're gauging demand. Uh, I think we'll have to see if uh, you guys are indeed correct uh, in terms of adoption. Uh, maybe there is good feedback from their their clients. Maybe they do want tokenized gold. I also struggle to see without the full impact of tokenization. You know, at at one hundred percent liquidity being there potentially lending services and, and other kinds of benefits. I'm not so sure I, I see the purpose either. The only thing that I also have to add is that it just seems like a lot of different companies are exploring the tokenization of commodities, which at least to some regard shows that the ones that are in the know are taking this very seriously, which p- perhaps will present some real solutions in the future. Oh, no doubt HSBC will take away a lot of good insights from this. Uh, and that's hopefully best practices they'll be able to apply in other use cases. And the more they do tokenization, the more they they can learn and take advantage of it. So I think it's great in the end. All right, moving into our next article. We have Switzerland's, their Helvetia phase three pilot uses the Swiss French CBDC for their financial institutions. They are launching another CBDC for wholesale, you know, large jurisdictions. This one coming from the state itself. So what do we think about CBDCs? Does anybody have a take on this space? I'm def- definitely happy to kick it off with the fact that, you know, whether it's stable coins or central bank digital currencies, I do got to acknowledge their infrastructure out their key component to, you know, securities markets. We need to be able to settle on chain to fully take advantage of atomic swaps. Uh, institutions care less about the fact that uh, it is a central bank uh, activity because they're quite used to already dealing with this in the traditional sense. Uh, so I actually think for them, it's a good thing that they're able to, you know, work with the state to be able to issue a, a central bank digital currency is what we call wholesale central bank digital currency. So the intention is not for it to suddenly reach Swiss citizens to be used in in retail capacity. This is meant for exactly the layer, I believe, of being able to settle uh, tokenized securities and other things, in this case, referencing the uh, the bonds that they're planning. You know, I I think you touched upon a great point there, Herwig. There's got to be a fine line in terms of where these governments think they can go with CBDCs because I think once you get to the point, as you mentioned, that they're not there yet, but once you get to the point where they're trying to get into the hands of citizens, that's when you start to see the people who have lots of security concerns about who's watching their money, where their money's going, who's controlling their money. I think that can be a fine line, whereas if governments try to, to – to breach into that area too soon, it can really, really hurt not only the CBDC argument, but hurt security tokens as a whole. Because I think you're going to see a huge fast of the population that doesn't want the government knowing where all their money is going. They don't want them to know that they have control over potentially where they're spending. And so they have to be very, very careful here. Um, so I'm definitely with you there. I think it's just something cool to bring up too is the fact that they're using their you know, Swiss Interbank Clearing SIC operated by SIX. Um, as we all know, SDX platform comes from SIX. And so something really interesting on their CSD side is the fact that they're one of the few providers that are both on-chain and off-chain rails and are able to interact with one another. So they're providing up the ability for, <clears throat> excuse me, in this case, it's for other institutions to be able to participate, which is great. Awesome point, uh, Sam, that you bring up. We're not necessarily going to citizens yet. But they are on those digital rails where if they wanted to go to citizens later on, maybe something clears up. You know, when you reach that point, you don't have to choose between people that are fully on chain or not. You can interact with one another. And this is something I brought up multiple times on the What's Tripping newsletter when SDX comes out with different issuances and whatnot is the fact that there's such an interesting uh, technology that they can leverage. Um, And so they're uniquely positioned here. I just wanted to make sure we bring that up and cover and cover those digital rails. Yeah, I'm team team wholesale, uh, definitely probably anti-retail. Uh, moving on, let's get into number eight. We're going to head over to Colombia, where the Bolsa de Valores, which is their uh, Colombian stock exchange, they now have a crowdfunding platform, A2 Senso, uh, with the idea being to enable 
uh, the, the crowd to invest small sums of money, crowdfunding, to be able to grow uh, small and medium-sized businesses, which with, to most economies represent lots and lots of businesses. Uh, so this is a very interesting move. You, you don't really see too commonly. I can maybe think of, of Israel and some other stock exchanges that have kind of taken on this, this route, but a crowdfunding platform tied to one of the com- you know, the, the country's stock exchanges, that's a pretty big deal. And if now they, uh, they've been around, but now they are supporting uh, specifically Hyperledger, Fabric, and Besu uh, for this, uh, presumably in order to enable a lot of the benefits like liquidity and, and other things. Anyone got a hot take here? Anyone got a, a, interesting insights to share? I'm hopeful that the first step here is them just accepting whether it's stable coins like USDC and others or investment through crypto, just because that process seems much more efficient, especially when you talk about smaller countries and their banking institutions. You know, we've done crowd a crowdfund through STM and we've seen dozens of issuers explore this process and working with all the intermediaries in between can be quite a difficult process that's streamlining a lot of this from a infrastructure perspective on the actual financing side seems to be the biggest opportunity for a lot of these firms to build a more efficient capital market fundraising environment. I think that if they're targeting the retail style of investor, it's a tough proposition, especially in this current market. Yeah, I I hear you on that front. Um, I'm definitely curious to see what kind of numbers, given the fact that the crowdfunding platform has been in operation for several years. So I I wonder, you know, what's what's the growth and the adoption there? What's the average investment size? How many people even know about it? I will highlight, though, that it is cool that they intend to use the tokenization to manage collateral uh, for their OTC derivative margins, uh, as one of their, uh, proof of concept. So I do think that collateralization is one of those key to unlocking, uh, crowdfunding markets and just tokenization in general. Uh, when there right. isn't liquidity on the secondary markets, it's, it's easy to cry foul, right? But if you can go collateralize, that's another form of liquidity. Uh, it's been very popular in crypto. It's been very popular in traditional real estate. And just the efficiencies of being able to collateralize tokenized assets and securities is, is just a huge use case that I think as a even if I'm investing a small sum, uh, it would be pretty cool to know that this marketplace, I could potentially at least get liquidity in the form of a, a loan as opposed to relying on the, the Colombian stock exchange. Again, don't want to speak to the, the levels of volume and, and how efficient it actually already may be. I think that's a good point. Um, if anybody has actually invested in a crowd fund before, I, I've participated in supporting different businesses through many of the largest platforms. And, you know, a lot of times it feels like you just, you know, you invest and then that's kind of it. So providing a, a opportunity for collateralization presents a, a really unique opportunity there for investors. What did producers prepare for the, our next article here? Maple launching on base, which is by Coinbase, of course, their latest uh, layer two that we saw earlier. Um, we, we saw backed uh, launch the first security token, and now it looks like already we're seeing a second one thanks to Maple. Yeah, Maple has done over $2.8 billion in capital since injections since its inception back in 2021 in May. So they are a serious player, specifically focusing on the treasuries and creating institutional financial investments. They are deploying this cash management solution for U.S. treasuries onto base. So it seems like we're seeing base providing a really competitive blockchain solution for a lot of these things. We know Coinbase is providing custody for a lot of these ETF Bitcoin applications. They're now creating a competitive blockchain to offer DeFi products that are also creating institutional style products. I mean, I would look out. Base may be the hottest blockchain to build security tokenization on going into 2024. They're building really quickly. I mean, they have a great user base to tap into, right? About 110 uh, mil and whatnot of active users on their on their platform. And it's really cool to see a couple of things, right? We have one of their offerings that's live today, their short duration U.S. Treasury yields from uh, Maple Cash Management. But the other one that's coming later in Q4 2023, so anytime between now and the end of the year, is a private credit opportunities exclusive to BASE. So I think this is really interesting, right? Because BASE just launched earlier this year, maybe in uh, Q3, I believe. 
And they're already making great strides and trying to onboard people. And having now an exclusive product solely available on base is going to incentivize people to go on, try their new uh, blockchain or their new platform. And mind you, I'm, I'm already onboarded, by the way. And I think it was a very seamless process um, as a Coinbase user and now on base as well. So this is really cool to see. And you know, excited to to at least get some metrics on you know how many people are onboarding now with this new product. Um, that's really over a hundred million people already have Coinbase accounts. Uh, they now are getting big into RWAs. Clearly, they actually just released an article the other day talking about the benefits of tokenization. You heard it from Anthony, uh, their head of tokenization uh, from Coinbase, as well as from Maple CEO Sydney. Uh, directly, uh, all the tokenized this just a few weeks ago. So, you know, I, I clap my hands to this news. I love to see this this come together. When you think of mate, when you think of the base token, it's not sexy. It's not going to give you the thousand X that a lot of people want when they're thinking about investing in layer twos and investing in, in cryptocurrency. But maybe that's what the ecosystem needs. They need a coin that's going to truly develop. We're going to see things built on it. We're going to see adoption. And potentially that lower volatility could help us a little bit um, because people aren't going to be investing in it because they want to make a ton of money right away. They're investing in something that they know is going to be here in 15, 20 years. And could we potentially be seeing the beginning of, you know, 2000, 2001, all the people invested in pets.com and we know where that is now. Maybe we're starting to see those Amazons and Ebays pop up that aren't necessarily as sexy, but in 15, 20 years, you're going to be really, really happy that you put a few dollars into it. That I guess, I guess time will tell. Let's head over to number that, seven. Yeah, please introduce it, Sam. Absolutely. So this is super exciting for me. Um, I know all of us have really looked into Blockstream in the past. We've spoken about the BMN1 token, which is the Blockstream mining note. What it did is it provided all different types of investors, mostly accredited, um, with access to Bitcoin hash rate at the enterprise grade facility. So instead of investing in Bitcoin as a whole, you can now invest in these miners. The same Blockstream token has recently launched the ASIC note and it successfully closed. And what it is, it's a Bitcoin denominated vehicle to market. And now investors can receive a Bitcoin on Bitcoin return. And Kyle and I have spoken about this a lot, that when you're in the crypto space, it's important to look at returns, not necessarily in a USD um, basis because you're not investing in that same currency. It's important to look at it in the currency you're investing in. And so now a 5% return on your Bitcoin investment should be seen as a 5% return on the Bitcoin that you invest in, not necessarily the US dollar value because of the volatility. Um, and so what this is, it's going to be, it's going to have invest, uh, investor protections. It's issued on Liquid, which is a layer two solution. And it's going to offer an opportunity to capitalize on the potential upside of historically low ASIC miner prices. We saw during the bull runs that ASIC miner prices get extremely, extremely high um, exorbitant prices. And right now we're in a very quiet period. Could be an interesting opportunity. Do you guys have any thoughts on this? Yeah, I know that the Blockstream mining note, which was basically their first vehicle, they did a security token offering. They raised nearly $50 million in order to – it's essentially a debt vehicle where you, you're you buying hashing power, which then mines the Bitcoin, and then you get the Bitcoin over time. We released a whole set of reports and research on how this was drastically better than investing directly into Bitcoin because you are essentially getting leverage in terms of getting a, a increased exposure on the underlying commodities. Sam, do you have any insight on the differences between the, the original Blockstream mining note and then this ASIC note? That's a great question. Um, so what I know, and I need to do a little bit more, the, the details are still coming out about the the ASIC note. Um, I believe that what you're investing in, in the preliminary one, so that's for accredited only. Um, I believe for this ASIC note, it's going to have a wider pool of potential investors. But if you remember, the, the minimum investment for the BMN1 token was very, very high. Yeah. Um, so this is going to have a lower barrier to entry. And not to mention, I believe that the actual miners yourself you're investing in are a little bit different. These are going to be exclusively the ASIC miners, um, right. whereas those were all enterprise grade facilities. So this is going to be a little bit more of a uh, condensed, maybe a little bit of a, I don't want to say simpler per se, but gives a, a larger pool of investors to be able to get involved. Right. Yeah. I remember they, they were only in the primary, they were only selling whole integer level shares. I believe it was $150,000 per share. Exactly. So it was definitely a very different institutional vehicle than perhaps something like this. I know that a lot of the, the Blockstream guys have worked with Bitfinex to, to have secondary trading for the Blockstream note, and they've potentially explored working with INX as well here in the U.S. So potentially we see a structure like this ASIC note being available to U.S. investors sometime soon. 
Bitcoin, ASIC, SpaceX, I get it. Uh, that's a great, great concept. We have a lot of research. You can check it out at reports.stm.co uh, if you're interested at all. And I love the fact that, you know, for those of you who don't know, this is this is also built on Bitcoin Lightning Network, which allows you to be able to issue proper compliance security tokens. And so they really, you know, they, they go through and through with the Bitcoin thesis here. I love to see it. Uh, moving on, number uh, five here, big news from JPM. Uh, they are saying that their JPM coin now does a billion dollars a day in, in uh, volume and processing. Uh, they say this is for their repo network uh, naturally, which we know is being used uh, quite a bit, uh, as well as they have their tokenized collateralization network, which presumably also uses this um, or uses it in some kind. Uh, but that's a it's a big uh, big news. Twenty four seven, we know that this trades uh, supposedly, right? We we don't. I don't know where you point to <laughs> necessarily to be able to actually say it's a billion dollars a day. I think we have to take their word for it. Though I don't think they're probably fudging any numbers here. Uh, there's there's obviously really great use cases for for stable coins, but a billion dollars in daily volume that's a it's a big deal. What does everyone else think on that? Does anyone else know where this transaction volume is actually going? I think that the number sounds great, and I'm sure from the press release it's really impressive, but I need to see a little bit more transparency on where these things are getting settled. Maybe it's the TCN, the collateralization network that they've built. Maybe it's through their Onyx platform, I and mean, presumably it is, but are these internal management where they're moving from, from one book to another or from one, one broker to another inside of their network? Is this external transactions? I think I need to see more before I really throw up the pom-poms and cheerlead this because I just have no idea what's actually going on. And that's a great point. I think we spoke about when they originally launched uh, the network that it's very privatized. There's not much on a public ledger that you can see. And so it brings up a really, really good point. Where exactly is this money being transacted from? I would have to – I'd bet that's probably internal. Um, but that was kind of one of the, the downsides of, of everyone that was super excited when they launched their own token. Thing is, none of this is public. We don't know any of it, and they're likely not going to divulge much of that information to to us because why would they? So, would love some more clarity there as well. Yeah, if I had to put my money on it, I guess I'd go repo transactions. You know, just doing bank to bank liquidity and and then leveraging the tokenized deposits. Herwig, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I, I don't want to point it to any one specific thing. I think obviously it's probably all of the above. Um, I do recognize from their article that at least uh, JPM, they viewed, I believe, in three different uh, buckets, they say, an internal ledger, a shared ledger, and a universal ledger in terms of the use cases. So for sure, again, we're probably not going to get a lot of insight, but we do know some of the folks over there at the Onyx team. We had Kirthi doing a great job talking about their whole infrastructure and ecosystem that tokenizes. this. Maybe in the future, we'll be able to get some light shed on this directly from the horse's mouth. Let's see what we can do here, folks. All right, moving into article number four, the Reserve Bank of Australia is now working on DLT and tokenization. They specifically came out with a report saying that savings can be up to $17 billion in Australian dollars, as well as saving anywhere from five basis points to 24 basis points just on settlements because of the end of the reduced collateral requirements. So we are having more research quantifying the benefits of blockchain. We've seen other institutions come out and give reports that even present even higher savings. But this is great to see that a large country is now making strides in quantifying the benefits of tokenization. Yeah, this is this is big news because I, uh, for, for anyone who doesn't know, the Australian stock exchange uh, back in the day was planning a radical transformation, digital transformation using DLT. And now you see the Reserve Bank of Australia reinforcing the same message to an even clearer tune now actually pointing out uh, I love to hear when it's you know up to 24 basis points in savings that's you know that really adds up when you start talking about trillions or uh, you know high billions in volume or settlement uh, or other use cases that they're you know performing with tokenization so it absolutely is significant clearly the, the RBA, the Reserve Bank, is is trying to uh, send the message that tokenization is something that should be considered. 
Um, and they're exploring it all, right? Cryptocurrency, stable coins, tokenized deposits, as well as a, a wholesale CBDC. Uh, so this is just good news again that I will probably see a trial uh, of more information come out with insights uh, and more use cases. They said in mid 2024, you know, the central bank will publish its research from from all of the, the trials and, and obviously shed some more light on their roadmap of what's going to get integrated in Australia. So this is, I think, again, a really cool ecosystem where we're going to see they, they have their own sort of regulatory regime. Uh, they obviously are considered a, a very you know, large financial center in the world. Uh, it'll be interesting to see how Australia kind of differentiates themselves, almost in an international arbitrage kind of way, you know, leveraging this technology to make their markets more efficient, and maybe better than other markets around the world first. Any other comments on this? If not, we're going to head over to some big news from the market. A big listing on T0, everyone. Fintech.tv by Vincent Molinari. They are doing a crowdfund. This is big news because uh, as far as I know, you haven't been able to invest in, in Fintech.tv before. Naturally, they've been big on this technology. And so we always love to see the industry eat its own dog food. But this is a first for T0. Uh, spreading their wings into the regulation crowdfunding world, which as a broker dealer, they're fully capable of. But as we all know very well, having even gone through this process ourselves, that uh, this is a, a whole nother level of compliance and infrastructure that's needed for the broker to be able to perform this. Naturally, they have the technology, they have a user base, they have everything in place. But certainly from a compliance side, it is a bit of a different process than they're, they're used to. So I think this is really great news to see um, them getting into it. In fact, before I open it up to the room, I'll end on a, uh, a quote here. Uh, I'll read from David Goon. Uh, we are excited to launch the fintech.tv crowdfunding campaign under our new T0 securities brand. The T0 Securities Band reflects the broad scope of our offerings and our market leading position, aka they still see it very much so as we're here, we're still providing listings, we're now launching offerings uh, that are unique, uh, such as crowdfunding. Uh, I love to see the activity. What does everyone else think? It's really interesting to see to see this come out now. I mean, they just announced that they were going to start supporting primaries a bit earlier this year, and now the new rebrand to T Zero Securities. So nice to see them, you know, in line here. Um, I will say, you know, they I, I personally didn't really hear much news come out of them over the past say twelve months or so, and so now for these like call it three announcements to come out within months of each other is really cool. You know, four dollars per class seat on non voting common stock or fintech TV. They cover. A wide variety of uh, subjects, anywhere from sustainability, blockchain, tech, finance, um, SDGs, and ESG. So anyone that, for them, since it's a crowdfund, anyone that watches their show that's already a supporter, it's a great opportunity for them to take advantage of. I do have a hot take, though. You know, this is now a, you know, T-Zero, I think we mostly knew them from the secondary market uh, perspective. Now they're bringing in primaries. And as we know, you know, to do specifically a crowdfund under Reg CF, you have to be a crowdfunding portal. So they have all these capabilities. Is T0 now siloing off to be their own thing where they're offering all services under one roof? And are they going to be maybe restricting themselves from working with others? Or do you think they're still open to integrating with other players around the ecosystem? Time will tell on the integration side, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, clearly, they. Uh, I, I'm not surprised at all about the, the primary market side. We've seen just about every... Uh, broker dealer that announced any kind of a marketplace end up in many cases uh, actually first launching primary markets or eventually also getting into primary markets like T Zero is now. Uh, I can't. I don't. I, I don't, can't imagine that surprises too many people, given the fact that it would be very hard to be building a a successful business on the trading fees from the trading volume that's happening in the space. So naturally, helping. Folks raise primary capital uh, where they naturally will be taking a percentage on on the raise. I assume you know that's another potentially fantastic business uh, yeah. revenue stream for them. It makes a lot of sense, I think. And I think when tokens are averaging you know eighty to two hundred dollars a day in 
in trading volume, it's, it's hard to uh, to keep the lights on, and so they kind of are forced to pivot. Um, and so that's what we're kind of seeing. Potentially, they, they have no choice. Um, hopefully, it works out, but I think we're kind of at a point in time right now where the adoption of the secondary side hasn't gotten to the level that many of us thought for whatever reason. Um, and so we're going to see a lot of the players that were very excited about the secondary trading are now all of a sudden on the primary side and, and dealing with, with those kind of transactions. Because as, as you guys have seen, and as all you viewers have, have probably seen yourself as well, unfortunately, the, the ecosystem right now is not uh, conducive to a successful secondary, which hopefully will be fixed in the near future. Absolutely right. And going into our next article, our penultimate article here of our first token debrief, we have the World's Bank issuing a digital bond with Euroclear. This is a 100 million euro bond on R3's quarter. We've seen R3 since the very beginning, working with the largest institutions, bringing tokenized products to market. And this bond is going to be listed on the LSE, the Luxembourg Stock Exchange, who is creating this and issuing this or providing the, this infrastructure for it. And of course, City and TD Securities actually were facilitating this issuance. So you had some big players that were involved. Guys, we have another huge bond issuance coming to market. How do you guys feel about it? I'm pumped about it. I absolutely love uh, seeing big, big news like this. Uh, very interesting, uh, continuing uh, use of this real world asset kind of uh, focus, even getting drawn into a very institutional narrative, right? There, Euroclear is one of Europe's biggest clearing houses. So uh, the fact that they are recognizing a new service with tokenized securities issuance, specifically with the World Bank, uh, 100 million euros is definitely no small amount. They've got the infrastructure. They're working with the Luxembourg Stock Exchange. They've got, you know, fantastic uh, issuer agent like City. Uh, this is, of course, a very, very institutional deal in that eyes. But, you know, they're they're looking at this $100 million or $106 million, 100 million euro uh, bond as just the beginning. Uh, again, we're talking about efficiencies in the form of basis points. And when you balloon that to a, an industry uh, that's in the trillions, uh, which is what they believe, they, of course, see a huge opportunity, a business opportunity, a market efficiency opportunity. Uh, and so to me, I think this is all major, major news uh, and maybe to some people's surprise or at least to me, haven't seen as much activity coming from the core to blockchain from R3. Uh, and so the fact that they chose uh, Corda for their bond issuance, I also think is a, a pretty big deal, a sign that R3 is still very much so focused on this space uh, for Corda. Great win for R3. And going into our final article here of the day, number one, the DTCC acquires Securency. If you've been in this space for quite some time, you may be familiar with Securency. They are an OG in the industry. And now the DTCC starting the acquisition spree. Herwig, you and I have talked about this on our show for predictions across many years now. It's not surprising to see the larger institutions acquiring the talent and the technology that is being built by some of the trailblazers in the industry. And so now we see the DTCC getting involved. Tarek, what are your thoughts? We are finally uh, right, Kyle. Acquisitions <laughs> <laughs> are happening. Kyle, you know, and it's not a really a hot take to say that uh, you know this is expected of the industry. Consolidation happens across the board everywhere. Um, but uh, this is a big deal because Securency was an OG company, if you will. They've been around for a long time. They built a large team, I believe over 100 people, uh, focused on this space. Uh, there are very few companies with that many people helping accelerate the adoption, building great technology, uh, which is naturally what DTCC, uh, DTCC saw. Um, so I think it's a big win for the industry because certainly it, it beats just hiring somebody who comes just from traditional finance looking at their digital asset strategy to now having someone like Nadine leading those operations. I think that's a, a huge, huge win for the industry because it just accelerates their experience, their knowledge, their ability to execute. 
Uh, and that, so I think it's a, a fantastic acquisition. Uh, usually when you don't see a price tag though, you know, there is that side of it, not necessarily good for the industry because one would think that if this technology is worth hundreds of millions of dollars and value add to, to the DTCC, which I believe it is, uh, and then some, uh, you would probably see that number be highlighted. Uh, and I've heard some, some rumors that it was not necessarily the best for, for everybody involved. So you don't really love to see that, but you do love to see that they found a great home, uh, that this is going to be still super productive for the industry. The DTCC does quadrillions in settlement. So the, the idea of even saving several basis points uh, is, of course, extremely meaningful. And really the ones that are going to lead the charge on the public equity side in the U.S., on the public markets, it, it, it really would be, I would be hard pressed to believe it would be any other firm other than the DTCC that can lead that charge and help aid with that transformation because they're so critical to that market infrastructure for all the different banks and institutions and everybody else and the, and the exchanges that work with them. Uh, so, you know, overall, uh, this is the number one right mo- news for a reason, because this is yeah. a big, big deal for the industry. I, I absolutely love it. Very excited for that whole team to be supporting their new DTCC digital assets division. One other interesting to note here is that we know Securency had done a lot of work in the MENA region, in the Middle East. So it's fascinating to see the DTCC expanding its coverage. This is a global financial and economic system at this point with technology, with everything that we're building. So this could potentially be an opportunity for them to build inroads with other jurisdictions and other transactional economies. And and a quadrillion dollars, guys, is 15 zeros. (laughs) <laughs> There's a lot of money in settlements we're talking about. We're not talking about billions. We're talking about quadrillion, 15 zeros. It's a number lot of money. Fake. It it, it's, hard, it, it's hard to even, it's hard to even fathom. It is hard to fathom. <laughs> well, what an amazing token debrief. I know we won't have that much news as we get back to weekly programming in the future, but really appreciate it, Jason, Sam, and Kyle, as always, your insights and takes on the the token debrief here so much going on in the industry really really love the fact that we've got new issuances major acquisitions more major trials by institutions 100 million plus uh dollar issuances uh columbia getting into the game you know just uh we're back baby we're back i love to see it yeah this is great thanks for everybody for joining us and i think that herwig now we can transition into the final segment our companies of the week Let's do it. All right, Harwig, it is episode 210, and we couldn't end a security token show without highlighting the two businesses that we wanted to shed some special light on that we wanted to cover as as doing some great things in the industry. So as always, how about you lead us off with your company of the week? Well, uh, absolutely, with pleasure. We would never get rid of our, our companies of the week. We have a company of the year to pick uh, at the end of the year, of course. And we've still got a few fresh weeks left to have some entrance as each uh, week's winner, of course, is a potential entrant for company of the year. And I just have to give it to our Uh We didn't get a chance to cover in our token debrief, but they did come out with some news. Uh, that they do plan after some fantastic uh, work with Aberdeen uh, and getting in on the primary market side, they are going to be getting active with their MTF. That's their multi-trading, uh, multilateral trading facility. It's the ATS equivalent over there in the UK, essentially meaning that they are opening up their marketplace, drum roll, before the end of the year. Let's hope that is indeed the case. I can't wait to see that. Uh, Archex has done so much great work leading the charge in the UK, uh, being one of the very first pioneers to to bring this to market, to probably talk to the regulators about what this technology means, to get the licenses for this. And now, finally, as they have been preaching for the last several years, the future of tokenized markets being on a, 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 a secondary market that they manage is finally going to go live. So, you know, I'm ecstatic to hear that news, Kyle. I know it's not officially live. And in this industry, we always have to take everything with a little bit of grain of salt. 
um, in terms of announcements, but I truly believe that they will be live by the end of the year since they said it. And therefore I got to give them my company of the week because that's just another, you know, huge step for the UK, huge step for the industry to have yet another very legitimate, uh, broker with fantastic technology and fantastic partners and issuers come to market. So major, major congratulations. That's exciting. They're a security token market partner as well. We've been working with them for many years now. So awesome for Archax. Herwig, all this week, are you ready yeah. for it? Is yeah, Maple me. Finance. I wanted to shout out yeah. Maple. They are leading the charge in DeFi applications for institutional financial vehicles. The In the blockchain industry, we've seen this divide segmentation between the DeFi and crypto crowds and then the more institutional financial markets. And I think that Maple is one of the companies that's really threading that needle well. They've created all kinds of on-chain products that are tokenizing treasuries, creating yields like that, and doing it in a very institutional way, certainly focusing on regulatory compliance. They've done $2.8 billion in capital injections and raising since the launch of their product, and now they're on base, the Layer 2 blockchain created by Coinbase. We covered all this on the show earlier. I just wanted to give a second shout out to Maple for doing some great things. Now that's a it's a great company of the week, Kyle. Love the the team over at Maple, also in Miami, uh, which yeah. is always great to see. Uh, but uh, with that, that's our companies of the week. So, Kyle, what a great show! I know I loved it. I'm looking forward to to this every week. Uh, even bringing in some new correspondence, bringing in some new segments. And as I mentioned, hopefully, we're going to start hearing it directly from the industry as we start bringing on guests uh, and interviewees onto the show. Uh, but we had to get right back to it. We couldn't let any more news slip through the cracks, could we, Kyle? No, we we had a jam-packed show today. I think that in the future, we may roll out additional segments, as you mentioned. And as always, if you're watching, you want to join the show, you've got some announcements, you want to come on and chat about what's going on, please hit us up on LinkedIn, on Twitter, on YouTube, on wherever you think you can find us. We're always available and looking to meet with the next hottest company in the industry. Of course we are. And for those of you who have been watching and listening and supporting, and those of you who are new, welcome to the Security Token Show family. We'll catch you every Monday with this new format. And of course, check out stm.co for all the latest and greatest when it comes to security token news, trading information, uh, press, and more. Uh, so with that, happy tokenizing. <laughs>